Great. Um, welcome, museum directors and educators, arts advocates, art teachers, art students, families of student artists, Voice of America, which is covering this event today for the world, uh, congressional offices, including uh, Louise Slaughter's office in the person of Jack Spaziano, and Department of Education staff. I'm going to name the museums represented in this show. And I ask those from the museum whose name I say, including the three students who are here from their respective museums, to please stand and stay standing until I get to the 16th and final museum. And then we will give you our hugs via our applause because you deserve big hugs. So let's start with uh, Boise Art Museum. Anyone here from there? Chrysler Museum. Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. Denver Art Museum. Flint Institute of Arts. Okay. Frist Center for the Visual Arts. Okay. Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. Jocelyn Art Museum. Madison Museum of Contemporary Art. I know you're here. The Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York. The Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts. I know you're here. Montgomery, OK. Uh, the Oakland Museum of California. Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. OK, welcome. The Phillips Collection. Princeton University Art Museum and Toledo Museum of Art. Welcome to the Department of Education. Okay, thank you. You are all here together from all across the country. You are here to celebrate the excellence that results from museums, education programs, and partnerships with their communities to provide art education for those in their formative years. You will see today such a wide variety of work by students in grades 1 through 12. I think you will find it stunning and be so grateful that such excellent and generous programs exist. From pre-college portfolio work from the Flint Museum of Art to the middle schoolers' uh, interpretations via math and art of the Man Ray exhibit at the Phillips Collection. Now, when I read the descriptions of each museum's education program, I have to say I was intimidated. <laughs> I was intimidated by what the students were able to take in and then translate into art. You will have that opportunity today when the students teach you how to integrate art and math. And I hope you are as intimidated and stunned and grateful. I am. I am grateful every day to have the work around me in this Department of Education to refer to as I do my work in behalf of excellent education for all of our people. And I can tell you that it makes a huge difference for all the employees who work here. I get calls from them telling me that frequently. You have no idea what this work means to me every day as I begin my work. Because we essentially do paperwork here. And we wonder sometimes, what does that matter? And when we see actual work from students and teachers, we know. So. Um, I'm Jackie Zimmerman, director of the Student Art Exhibit Program here at the department. Uh, we are now um, beginning our 13th year, thanks to all the amazing teachers, students, and families around the country, and to my colleagues, Doug Herbert here, and Carrie Jasper, where 
Carey is here somewhere. Um, the exhibit that you're going to see today, that you have seen, and today's opening are possible mostly, and I would want to say only because Andy Finch, where's Andy? Andy Finch of the Association of Art Museum Directors, and Suzanne Wright from the Phillips Collection here, and Alexandra Mosier, where's Alexandra? There. Um, spent the last year with us <laughs> to create what you see today. So could you please stand to receive your kudos? Now, Alexandra is just finishing up her uh, master's degree at the um, Corcoran School at George Washington University, and she's going to be going off to the Getty Museum in California at the end of the summer. And um, I'm going to um, give you a responsibility. Um, we recently had here the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz for their annual jazz informants. And they told me that their goal is to get jazz in every school in America. And so Alexandra, your goal must be to get art in every school in America. Okay, deal? Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, the art exhibit program here uh, at the Department of Education is meant to accomplish two things. One, to honor students and teachers for their work from the classroom and education programs as a path to knowledge for all. And two, uh, I've mentioned a bit of this, uh, as a source of beauty and understanding for Ed employees and all their guests who pass through here every day. It is a way for us to keep up front whom we are working for every day. That is highly intelligent, creative, observant, risk-taking, and thoughtful students and teachers committed to excellence in all they do. Why is this important? A letter writer to the Washington Post this weekend <clears throat> said in response to a discussion <clears throat> excuse me, about what counts in a formal education. I always distinguish, she said, between skills training, medical school, barber school, engineering school, et cetera, that makes you ready for a job, and education, English, history, philosophy, art, et cetera, that makes you ready for a complete life. I recently discovered that the arts figured prominently at the launch of this Department of Education in early 1981. The first Secretary of Education, whose picture portrait is here, Shirley Huffstedler, had um, asked her staff to collect art by students from around the country to feature at the opening of this department. Um, in addition, at the opening, she requested musicians of all ages to come and perform here for the opening of the Department of Education. So when I learned that, I felt that I had been somehow compelled beyond my free will <laughs> um, to get back to our origins by celebrating the arts in schools. So let today be uh, a new celebration of all that you do to get yourselves and us ready for a complete life. Speaking of such a life, let me introduce you to Jamie and Studley. She is our Deputy Undersecretary of Education. Her focus is on higher education issues, including quality, access, accountability, completion, and student information. She was the Deputy and General Counsel of the Department under the Clinton Administration. She was a Special Assistant to the Health HEW uh, Secretary in the Carter Administration. She was president of Skidmore Univer College. She was the associate dean and lecturer in law at Yale University, uh, Yale Law School, pardon me. And to me, 
Um, Jamie is a true champion of the arts who has helped me feel whole in my work from her appreciation of the art that surrounds her at Ed every day. And I'll let her tell you why she appreciates it. Welcome, Jamie and Studley, please. Thank you so much, Jackie. It really is wonderful to be part of a team that cares so much about students uh, through the art. And in that, I welcome all of you because you are part of that extended family and that team. I'm delighted to be listed under the, on the program under the heading Arts Advocates, along with somebody I have admired throughout her career and um, am thrilled to have the chance to meet her through this um, arts uh, exploration together and AAMD. Uh, it is a joy to be able to celebrate what you have brought to us and the work that embodies what we do here at education. Uh, Jackie put it really, really well, but the, the art that you bring to us does become part of our daily lives, just as you have managed to make it part of the daily educational experience of students. Um, we bring together with the show that you've brought to us exploration in the arts and sciences, um, schools, teachers, and museums working together, um, preparing tomorrow's artists and leaders so that this kind of reflection is part of their experience. I am always impressed by the maturity of the work that's in these shows. I think from these slides, uh, you can understand what I mean. Uh, Jackie runs a, um, in some places it would be a rental uh, museum. She brings us art that we can take up to our office space. Right. Not from your show, because that's for everybody. This one is one that I immediately gravitated to and put on the wall in my office suite. I'll leave it out here so you can take a look at it. Um, but let's give credit to um, Gavin Bruns. It's Sleeping Fox. Gavin was a fifth grader when he did this piece of work. And I just immediately saw it as embodying so many of the kinds of things that we understand as being important in uh, arts education, and also in the wider set of uh, education values that we're all striving for. Uh, problem solving is, always comes back to me as artistic problem solving. He wanted to capture something about this fox. I thought the way he caught the emotion of the fox, the way you, you feel that animal. The dimensionality, the three-dimensional solution, that's unusual and I think particularly effective. The colors just draw me in each time I see it. And last night I was at the Phillips for your opening reception for this work. And there was a painting there that made me think of uh, this remarkable sleeping fox. It's called Deer in the Forest. And I saw a professional adult artist's effort to address exactly the same questions, I think different animal, similar depth, and I'd love to think of students like this one at the Phillips saying that is a fellow artist. I am doing the same thing that person is doing. And I know that's the kind of education work that you all try to do, to have these students see themselves, you students see yourselves, as participating in this age-old challenge of understanding the world through the arts. And I just welcome the fact that you are doing it with us and doing it at a level that other museums, other schools across the country can model. Um, everything that we do at the department in terms of education can touch the work that you are doing. When I think about the central uh, force of what we are about, opportunity for all students and wider horizons for all of them, clearly that is at the core of the work that you are um, doing every day in these museum and education programs teacher recruitment and professional development, giving experienced teachers new ways, new pathways to do things that are exciting and rejuvenate them, um, helping teachers uh, address new kinds of material and keeping things interesting and lively, and creating professional development linkages among museum personnel, experienced teachers, and newer teachers in the field so that they understand what they can accomplish and want to stay with this important work. Teaching core competencies, 
I don't have to repeat for you the things that are central to a quality education at whatever level. Critical thinking, communication, um, understanding of quantitative values. You can probably see, as I do this, some of the themes. Uh, global understanding, ability to appreciate difference. Some of these works even embody teamwork and artists working together to achieve a collaborative vision. And all of that helps us as we develop the kind of global awareness that we would like students to have. Some of these pictures, too, show us cultures uh, different from our own, eras of history that we want to understand to understand our present and our future. And on a very concrete level, as we think about persistence and completion, getting everybody to and through college, sounds very practical. Giving people the tools to express themselves, the ability to use different methods within education to find where their strengths are, to, cut a, to cross in disciplinary boundaries so that their learning uh, makes sense and they can use it uh, in the kind of social justice that literally just popped up on the screen. Um, another way to use art. All of that comes together and supports both tangible accomplishments like college completion and intangible ones, lifelong learning, preparation for democracy, all of the things that we hope for for the next generation of students whom you are teaching. Uh, just recently, I saw a wonderful piece on 60 Minutes about Misty Copeland and the way that her arts education was her pathway um, to a life she had never expected and an enormous change and opportunity for her. Um, whether on the level of breakouts like Misty Copeland uh, to the daily rich learning that you provide to all of your students. I simply want to thank all of the museum leaders and educators, all of the people who support you, and especially you students who are blazing a trail and showing us what creativity can look like in all of the many, many wonderful ways in which you do it. So please join me in applauding the students who are here today and represented in the art of art. Thank you all. I look forward to enjoying the show with you, and I know that my colleagues here in the department are looking forward to see what you and your museums have brought to us this year. Thank you very much. Yes, it's my privilege to introduce Jeanetta Cole, um, wasn't sure of the order here, who is the incoming president of AMD, a fellow colleague in federal service as the director of the African um, Art Museum of the Smithsonian, and an education leader and inspiration to many of us. Thank you. And thank you, Sister President. I know you're an undersecretary for education, but for me, you will always be a Sister President. Good morning. It's an unusually great morning. And let me tell you why, at least for me. It's because we have gathered around my two passions, education and art. I'm completely convinced that education is at its best when it is done creatively and art is at its most powerful stage mm, when it is educating. So, we've already experienced this morning in words from both Jackie and Sister President some sense of what can happen when young'uns, that's a word I use respectfully and also affectionately for our young people, we've already had a sense of what can happen when young'uns are wrestling with, engaging with that part of themselves which is creative. It can at times be life changing, but at least we know it is going to help our students, our young'uns, 
perhaps not to make a good living, to use Sister President's point, but to live a good life. Because of that intersection of education and art, those of us who are privileged to work in art museums are really more than grateful for this, I won't call it exhibition, I'm going to call it a happening. And so one of my treasured responsibilities this morning is to say some thank yous. First to say thank you to the Department of Education. You know, President Nelson Mandela probably captured it as well as anyone when he said that the most powerful tool for changing the world is education. And here we are seated in our nation's U.S. Department of Education where we have been completely surrounded by a value, the value that this Department of Education places, has in students and their creativity. So huge thank you to our Department of Education. But I also want to say a thank you to the participating art museums. You've seen the list. We've even had the joy of acknowledging representatives from these participating museums. So to you, my colleagues, and certainly to the teachers and the students who are engaged with you, we say not from the top, not from the middle, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. I also want to thank the organizations and the individuals whose support has made it possible for AAMD, the Association of Art Museum Directors, to engage in a partnership with the Department of Education, not for the first time, because that could just be, you know, it just happened, not for the second time when you might think, oh, are we working up on something this annual? But for the third time, which suggests we have discovered a good thing. And so really strong thanks to our funders, NEA, NEH, and IMLS. And we also, those of us associated with AAMD, want to say thank you to the generous individuals, foundations, corporations who are supporting, and talk about creativity, the title is just bursting with it, Museums and Look How We Write Partners in Learning. The 243 members of the Association of Art Museum Directors are proud of the fact that each and every year we work with about 40,000 schools. And our work with schools involves everything from, from a one-time field trip to deep and lasting partnerships, like the one you will see in action later this morning. But our museum's role in education is not limited to schools. We are also deeply involved in education through our public programs, films, lectures, panel discussions, through our performances of music and dance and theater, and perhaps most of all, through our exhibitions because if our exhibitions do not help our visitors to rethink how they have been thinking about something, we are surely falling short 
of our responsibility. And so I want to end my comments by once again thanking each and every individual organization that has made today's exhibition and program possible. And I want to, I want to lift up the power of partnership by sharing with you the words of a wonderful African saying. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. It's good going together. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Brittany Prieto, and I'm the Assistant Museum Educator for Teen Programs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. One of the many teen programs we offer at the Met is Saturday Sketching, a free monthly drawing program in our galleries that hosts about 700 teens over the course of every year. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Yulia Koshiva, one of the artists whose work represents the program today. Yulia? Hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I want to th say thank you to all organizers of that amazing event. And uh, it is the first time my artwork is being exhibited, so I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> this exhibition also brought me and my family to Washington, D.C. It's such an amazing city. And um, all right, let's talk about a little of my experience. Uh, my experience making art and classes at Metropolitan Museum helped me discover my different talents uh, and skills in other um, arts, Sp specifically uh, computer art, which I do in school. Um, I'm focused on using computer art in my uh, future education and maybe future career. Um, I started with class in Metropolitan Museum uh, in the summer of 2014. I had curiosity to find a new experience to grab my interest, and I learned about the art museum programs and opportunities at the Metropolitan Museum. Finding a class also helped me find myself. Uh, before these classes, I knew I could draw, but inspire, inspiration of all the arts in museum uh, encouraged me to explore my own talents and go further. Uh, at the previous Saturday sketching classes, I became comfortable and learned to focus more on the details and artwork that I drew from each time. Um, and over time, I developed my own process of creating uh, and seeing things with my own perspective. When I drew this drawing, um, I wasn't distracted at all. I had, f I had a feeling that it was really important to me so far. Uh, I choose to work with this uh, rock sculpture uh, because uh, from my point of view, even though it was stone, it felt like there was something soft in it. I was really, really drawn into the face and I felt like it was looking, I was looking right in a real person. And the rest of his form and body uh, formed in my mind, uh, more I was looking at it and drawing from it. Once I found this piece, I spent in the entire two hours uh, in the class only on this drawing. The drawing is done with a charcoal pencil and uh, with white county pencil on a tone paper. Uh, the original work of art inspired me, but there was all other objects on the view in the same gallery which were also very inspirational. By looking at the other elements, I discovered uh, the common style, and uh, this helped me decide which drawing techniques uh, I wanted to use it and details to include. I'm very happy with where this drawing is now. 
uh, but I enjoyed <laughs> the process and looking at the original work so much, and I felt I could spend m even more time uh, with, it, with it, and with more effort and techniques, I would include more of my vision and imagination to continue it, uh, to make it my own. Uh, I would not be an exact, it would not be the exact copy because it would be not fair to the original artist. And, but it also would help me develop my own artworks and move further. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, it is young people like you that makes all of us show up to work every day. Thank you so much. That was just really beautiful, and I just love your reflections on the process and what that meant for you. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Jackie Terraza, and um, I work at the Metropolitan Museum as an educator, but I'm also here um, in my role as outgoing director of the Museum Education Division of the National Art Education Association and I'm joined by two educators whose programs are featured in the exhibition. Welcome, I'm Ann Henderson. I'm Director of Education and Outreach at the Frist Center for the Visual Arts in Nashville, Tennessee, and I've had the pleasure of collaborating with Suzanne on this project and with Andy as well, so happy to be here. And I'm Suzanne Wright, Director of Education at the Phillips. And we're so glad that there are so many other uh, museum educators here as well as museum directors. Thank you for your, uh, for your work and for your support and, um, and all that happens at museums every day. Um, I'm curious, think for yourself, how many of you think of a moment when you've had an aha moment um, at an art museum, when you've been looking around and something has grabbed you or all of a sudden you've come to that place of understanding either about yourself or about what you're seeing, or about the world you're in. And I bet if I asked you to raise your hands, yeah, raise your hand, raise your hand. If you've been, the whole room fills up. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that kind of aha moment is part of a very complex process that we call learning. And learning is not simply learning about, but it's really learning in a whole bunch of different ways. That includes our minds, that includes our sense of selves, that includes our bodies, that includes our creativity, it includes our relationship to the environment and to our society. And um, both AAMD, the Association for Art Museum Directors, and the National Art Education Association um, know that this is really important. The work that happens in museums every day in terms of learning is very important, and we want to better understand what that is and how it is that art museum programs benefit students. And so to that end, we've begun a research project to precisely understand that, and we hope to be able to develop that project, um, and we're now in the planning year, over the next three years, because we really want to be able to demonstrate exactly what is that value that art museums provide. Um, uh, to quote my boss, Sandra Jackson Dumont, um, the question is not so much how do we learn in art museums, but rather how do we learn and what role does art play within that important process? So with that, um, we have a number of museums uh, represented here in the exhibition whose projects, uh, the, the work that is on view comes out of experiences that happen during the formal school day, and some examples of those are, for instance, the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art has a really interesting program, Toledo Art Museum, Boise Art Museum, Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts, these are just a few. But what is also interesting is the ways in which art museums extend learning beyond the formal school day, with and beyond the schools. And so to that end, I'm wondering, Anne, if you can talk a bit about the project at the Frist. Thanks, Jackie, I'd love to. Um, so the project at the Frist Center um, is working with teens, and as similar to other programs that are represented in the exhibition, such as the Youth Council from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts or the Denver's Art Museum Art and Social Justice uh, class that's a distance learning program, 
we are focused on teens and really wanting to help develop um, teens' leadership skills, their understanding of civic engagement, and really seeing how real life experiences can impact um, their, their sense of engagement with the community around them. So in 2012, we created a program called Stop, Take Notice. And this was a project that was inspired by the artist Carrie Mae Weems. We had her work at our exhibition, at our museum, and part of her focus was to really get the community to look at their environment and see what the issues were that they needed to address in their community. So we worked with four different organizations in Nashville and asked them, to, the teens, to look at their community, think about issues that related to them. They then worked with teaching artists to translate those ideas into a work of art. And part of that development was that the work of art had to be interactive. So it was interactive from magnets to different um, types of things you could leave in response. Um, and then the, the challenge for us was the works were installed at the different organizations. The following year, we recreate, oops, sorry. We recreated these works then at the Frist Center and asked our visitors to interact with these works of art as well. So this work, which is shown here, was created by middle school students and it addressed the issue that they identified, which was the balance of that fragile line between human life and violence and what happens when life is lost due to violence. They created pinatas as a sense of being a fragile uh, work of art and they put inside their messages about what they brought to their world and to their, their environment and then the pinatas were broken apart. So the messages were hung at the Frist Center and we invited visitors to leave their responses too about things that impacted them, um, losses they had had, memories that they had and wanted to share. So it was really a very powerful work um, and there were many of them all down our community arts gallery. So it's a free, accessible place to everyone. Then the following year, this project had many legs and many lives, oh, well, there we go. Um, the following year, one of the organizations that participated with us, Hume Fogg Magnet Academic High School, which is about a block and a half from the Frist Center in downtown Nashville, um, chose to take on a project focused on pedestrian safety and driver awareness. And this was in response to um, the loss of one of their classmates who had been tragically killed in a crosswalk um, in downtown Nashville around the school. And the student, we reached out to them, um, educators went down and met with them, and the students said, we liked the stop, take notice idea, and we want to translate that now into this pedestrian safety and driver awareness campaign. So they created graffiti art um, that went around buildings, such as at the Frist Center, or actual graffiti art kind of inspired by the artist Banksy um, that went up around the school and unfortunately disappeared very quickly because it was very popular. Um, <laughs> but um, the work really um, was to get people to stop and to begin to recognize. And I think what the students have learned out of this is a much greater um, sense of community awareness in that now the students, um, Elena would have been a senior, so the seniors, her classmates, have gone another step beyond just art, but now to civic engagement and social, social activism. And they have met with mayoral candidates, uh, a mayoral forum to present their concerns. They have done a student assembly at their school where they've presented window stickers and ha addressed the issues and trying to make it an awareness issue within the, their population there at the, for the teens. And next, coming up at the end of this month, is a community forum where they've again invited mayoral candidates, they've invited city council members, they've invited the downtown partnership, they've invited the public um, school system to be there as well as the police. So this is really a project that has taken many legs and, and really has grown exponentially in terms of, you know, you don't know what's gonna happen from one event to the next. And so this is really just a fantastic, I think, example of how art museums can play a role in people's lives and really make a community impact. So we're, we've been delighted to participate in it, so it's been a lot of fun. Amazing. I'm just struck by the sustained inquiry and the su sustained action of this type of program over time and the way that these w the same group of students also in this last year have really taken it that much further. And uh, we were talking about rigor yesterday and where is rigor in these kinds of programs not because there isn't rigor but because rigor takes so many different shapes and this is one example and I'm wondering Suzanne if you can talk about um, how that plays out at the Phillips. Sure thanks Jackie. I also wanted to just talk about rigor a little bit more broadly too and to really 
include our education colleagues who are in the audience. And uh, can our educator colleagues raise their hands just so we can see who they are? It's, don't be, they're not, you're not shy. Come on, okay. Um, one of the things I think is interesting just to, to frame this part of the discussion is in art museums, as you know, the curators really have um, this love of the object, of the painting of the art object, and start the conversation with the object. Educators, on the other hand, start with the audience and really bring uh, a passion for understanding their audiences, connecting with their audiences, collaborating with them, and co-creating with them. And I think that Anne's example from the Frist is a great demonstration of that, and in that way, rigor, that it's this sustained, as you said, Jackie, uh, ongoing relationship. Like, would these kids have reached out to the Frist again if the Frist hadn't proven that they were a trustworthy partner? You know, that it's, it's this kind of thing over and over again and that they listened, that the Frist listened. And that's, I think, just such a great example of rigor. Uh, and as you go through the exhibition today, you'll see this over and over again, the way that museums are really listening and collaborating with their communities. Uh, in terms of the Phillips program, you're, g you're gonna hear all about it in just a minute. And it's uh, a collaboration with um, one of our partner schools, Kenmore Middle School in Arlington, Virginia, in conjunction with an exhibition that just closed of Man Ray's artwork. And uh, I want you to look for elements of rigor uh, as you hear them talk. And for this program, I want you to look at rigor in terms of arts integration and the way that art and other curriculum areas are woven together in a really robust and powerful way. So when you're listening, listen for how art is being taught and how students are taking in art as well as how other curriculum areas such as math and technology are being taught and how these things are being woven together. And you'll start to see the degree of rigor that really is um, at the foundation of this strong partnership between the Phillips and Kenmore. Um, I'm trying to think of, oh, the other piece that I, I'm looking, I see um, Randy Korn in the audience um, who is uh, uh, really wonderful evaluator. And I just wanted to, to end with thinking about how art museum educators just really go through this very um, thoughtful and deliberate process from program development, implementation to evaluation, and back around again. Uh, it's, it's such a great group of colleagues to, who are very reflective of their programming and take their um, role in our society extremely seriously in terms of what we're offering and how we can continue to improve it. So I know time is short, but the question that we want you to leave with today is we are here in the Department of Education, and so how do we make the kinds of experiences that are featured in uh, the exhibition that is just outside available and possible for all students? Not because those, ex you know, those projects, your project is not a project for 30,000 kids, it's a project for a small group of people. Um, so it's not that all projects need to be large scale, but rather many more of these kinds of collaborations and these kinds of programs need to be happening across the country. And so how do we work from our individual places to make that happen and how do we collectively work together to make that happen? So without uh, further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to the next part of the program. Good morning, I guess. I can still say good morning. My name is Shauna Dyer, and I am the Arts and Communications Technology Focus Coordinator at Kenmore Middle School. Kenmore Middle School, as stated before, is located in Arlington, Virginia. 
And we are a uh, school that has an arts and communications technology focused program where we look to integrate the arts into our instruction wherever possible, wherever there is that natural connection. And I am standing here today actually representing a team of teachers. Um, Ms. McGee, Corinne McGee, is our math coach, and she'll be speaking in a few minutes. But I also represent Cassidy Nolan, our technology education teacher, and Jeff Wilson, our art teacher. We were approached by the Phillips Collection to um, collaborate with them on um, the Man Ray exhibit and using it as perhaps an inspiration for some of our instruction. And collaborations with museums such as the Phillips Collection allow us to be creative, and we love that. Um, testing gets boring. So, um, so I just want to take a few minutes uh, to explain a little bit about Kenmore and then highlight our three integrated units, and then we have a couple of students that will go a little more in depth on what they did. Uh, as I said, Kenmore is located in Arlington. We have grades six through eight. We have about 896 students that attend our school. We are a very diverse school. Um, in that we have um, students from many different ethnic backgrounds. We have 31% of our students are English language learners, and 53% uh, of our students are on re free or reduced lunch. When we met as a team of teachers at Kenmore, we used the PRISM uh, K-12 by uh, the Phillips Collection, sort of as a lens for us to begin to develop our uh, units of study, and really looked at, well, how can students begin to identify, compare, connect, express, empathize, and synthesize with the Man Ray exhibit? And from that discussion, we developed three units of study. The first one took place in the art room, and really focused on Man Ray's process. How did he use one art medium to inform the next? Um, so we took the art teacher, Jeff Wilson, took students um, through a process where they studied color field artists um, and then began to apply some of what that they learned from those color field artists to a sculpture, which in this case was a lantern. And then we had students take pictures of their lanterns and incorporate math formulas related to spheres and circles to create new images, kind of following the process that Man Ray took when he took photographs of math models and then later um, took those as inspiration and created paintings. In our technology classroom, um, we really thought about, well, how can we be giving students the technology skills they need, but get a little art in there too, use that for as perhaps an inspiration. Um, how would Man Ray maybe have taken advantage of the 21st century technology that our students have today? So we developed a lesson that included students using a 3D printer, photography, bright, using the Bryce software, and Photoshop. And Omar is going to talk about that in just a few minutes. And finally, with working with our uh, math coach, we uh, thought about math. And actually, Man Ray really mapped it out for us because he did a work called um, Obstruction and even wrote out some instructions. And so we. Uh, uh, took that and turned it into an exponent lesson. And um, we have a student here, Lauren, who's going to talk a little bit about her experience with that. So uh, it was a very inspiring time for us. We have gotten so much out of this collaboration. I think our students have learned about an artist that they normally probably wouldn't have heard of. And um, it really made us kind of stop and think about how his work could yet inspire our learning and um, ultimately their artwork. And so I'm going to invite Omar to come on up. And he's going to describe what they did in his technology education class.
Hi everyone, my name is Omar. I'm from Kenmore and I'm in eighth grade. And that little character right there is Martin. He's my superhero. And some of his superpowers are that he can fly, he has heat vision, and he can shadow travel. And for those of you that don't know what shadow travel is, it's basically that he can go into any shadow, blend in with it, and then jump to the next shadow within seconds. And how I made him was on Master Cam, as you can see right there. I just like I just took off like Mr. Nolan taught us how to like use Master Cam. Then after that, we went on up by ourselves and created a character of our own and printed him out like in, in the end. Then after that, we learned a little about a little bit about um, about Man Ray, and we learned that he uses geometric shapes to create a story. So after that, we went to the back of the classroom, took geometric shapes, and took pictures of them at different angles and. What we and after that we took pic we went on to Bryce as you can see over there, we created a background that tells the story of our character, and after that we went to Photoshop and created a picture like this, and to explain my picture right here the dark looking one, is Martin's been in a concussion for ten years or so and in those ten years, um, like evil villains have taken over. And these geometric shapes are supposed to like represent the villains that like that have fallen and yeah, that's my presentation. <laughs> Hello, I am Lauren Paddock and I go to Kenmore Middle School. Today I'm talking to you because I was part of the team that worked on this project and I worked on it with the art teacher, Mr. Wilson, and the math coach, Ms. McGee. We started the project and we learned a math lesson about exponents of two. One interesting thing I learned in this math lesson was any number to the power of zero equals one. We painted the hangers with a wash so that it had a light and drippy sensation. We chose to use colors from that are next to each other in the color wheel. That way it had this light and flowing feeling, also like the wash. One thing I thought was smart is that we painted a few extra hangers in case we needed them. Turns out we did. <laughs> <laughs> when we installed the mobile in Kenmore's staircase, it fell. Um, when we got to the bottom of the stairs, we realized that a few hangers had broken off. So we quickly repaired it and then brought it back up to the top of the stairs. We changed one thing, though. With the top hanger, we looped it around so that it made a O or a circle shape. That way it fit on the flagpole nice and easy. And it worked. As many of you may have guessed, the math part of this lesson is the powers of two represented by different levels on the mobile, like two to the power of zero, as I said before, is one. That's why we had one hanger on the top. Then two to the power of one equals two. And that's why we had two hangers below that. Then we went all the way to two to the power of five, which equals 32. And we had 32 green hangers at the bottom for a grand total of 63 hangers. When we finished the project, I decided I would never forget the wonderful time I had combining my two favorite subjects, art and math. And I'm done. <laughs> Hello, my name is Corrine McGee and I'm the math coach at Kenmore Middle School. And Lauren explained the large mobile that we made, the large scale mobile. Um, and we, oh, I didn't do my thing. Don't worry. And I, there we go, sorry. Um, Lauren explained the large scale mobile that we did as a group project with our morning math group. But we also made smaller scale mobiles for the students to have to take home. And we also actually did these for a teacher night at the Phillips, and it was a lot of fun playing with the chenilles with the teachers. So what we're going to do is end today with everyone is going to make their own little hanger. 
And after we do that, we're going to put you in groups of seven, and you are going to construct your own little exponential mobile. So what you need to do is take your chenille, and I noticed a lot of you used it as a fidget, so if you need another one, we can get you another one. <laughs> um, take and hold your chenille at about thirds, and then you're going to cross it over and form a triangle, and there's a little more mathematics in this. A triangle is the symbol delta in mathematics, and I like to think that we are changing education by integrating arts, so that's my little go for that. Then that's all you have to do is twist the top, and voila, you have your own little miniature hanger. We chose to use analogous colors uh, for these chenilles here. When we did our mobile, obviously we did them kind of in order. I don't know that that's going to happen with us today here. But what I'd like you to do is to stand up and get into groups of seven and maybe find someone that you don't know to be in your group and come together to form your own uh, mini hanger mobile. So everybody up. <laughs> everybody find someone. If you'd like to extend your mobile, please feel free to come up and get more chenilles. What was this like for you? Can we have anybody share what this experience was like? Teamwork. Fun. Exponentially invigorating. How about in the back there? I see some folks still working at, from AEP. They're working on theirs. <laughs> AEP, what was it like for you? <laughs> Most proud of your hangers. A lot of admiring of the hangers. How about those in the way back? Are you still working on yours? Looks like they're still working. I, and this is what happens when you integrate art. You lose everybody's focus and attention. <laughs> yeah. Engagement. 
Okay, anybody else? Um, Janetta, how's you? Oh, Janetta's trying to get hers in there. There she goes. Oh, they want more colors. I feel like I'm doing play-by-play. -play. What am I doing? I'm not sure. So um, I think we're ready to wrap up, right? Okay, Doug. All right, so my job, which I always fail at in life, is to bring order to chaos. So if you will have your seats, we have a very important part of our ceremony that's been with us for the almost 13 years, as Jackie mentioned, and that is to make sure that all of our student artists come up here and have their photograph taken here to, move, to document this event. Our artist photographer, Paul Wood, is with us to take care of the artistry of this. And as the, if I can get the student artists from all the museums whose work is here and you're wonderful to share with us, please come up. And I'll tell you why you're coming up. Um, this exercise was uh, poignant for me on two fronts. I hear two criticisms at home. One is that next to my closet, I have a little container from the dry cleaners where I put all my hangers. And then about, it overflows. My wife always says to me, when are you going to take those hangers back to the cleaners? And the second one is, I always hear from her, why can't you balance a checkbook? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring all my hangers, and I'm going to come over to Kenmore before you guys finish the semester, and I'm going to learn something about math and art, OK? <laughs> and I want to mention, I have to say, I'm so proud of Kenmore because they're not only a partner school of the Phillips, they're also a partner school through the CETA program, which is Changing Education Through the Arts, of the John F. Kennedy Center, and we provide support to the Kennedy Center as our National Arts and Education grantee. So congratulations to Ken Moore for all of your wonderful work with the Phillips and with the Kennedy Center and for being here with us today with students and teachers and other supporters from the school. But everyone who is an artist from the ex exhibition, please come up. Come on up. We're going to get your photograph first, and then if I could ask Jamie, Jonetta, our directors of education at the museums, our trustee members who are here, our other leaders of the museums who are in the exhibit today, please queue up over here behind Jamie. And we're going to add you to the photograph. And I'm going to turn it over to the artist.